Hello, Kiki Libertarian here. Welcome to the next episode of 10 Minute Game Show Reviews. As before, I'll discuss a brief history of the show, including the people involved, the gameplay, give the show a grade, and talk about how I'd revive it if I was given the chance. With all that in mind, let's get down to business. Where every decision is a gamble and every move can be your last. This is a game show that ran for a total of five years in a 14 year period, but it's still one of my all time faves. High Rollers was based on the dice game Shut the Box. In that game, after you roll the dice, you add up the total showing and remove one of any combination of the numbers 1 through 9 that equals the total number on the dice. How do you turn something so simple and mundane into a game show? By giving away fabulous prizes and a chance to win thousands of dollars in cash, of course. High Rollers debuted on NBC on July 1st, 1974 and spawned a weekly syndicated version in 1975. Both versions were gone the following year, with the daytime version ending on June 11th, 1976. However, nearly two years later, on April 24th, 1978, NBC brought it back as the new High Rollers with an overhaul format. Unfortunately, it would disappear again on June 30th, 1980, along with two other NBC game shows to make room for David Letterman's ill-fated daytime talk show. The other two shows in question were Chain Reaction, starring Bill Cullen, which had been on the air for just six months, and the original Hollywood Squares, which had been part of NBC's daytime lineup since 1960. However, seven years later, as part of the game show bubble of the 1980s, High Rollers was revived again in syndication on September 14, 1987. Unfortunately, it was not able to find an audience, and its last episode aired on May 27, 1988. However, it did find new life in reruns on USA, running until 1991, which is where most of us first saw it. The host of both 70s versions was Alex Trebek. A native of Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, Alex has been on our TV for more than 40 years. Of course, we all know him best as the host of the syndicated stalwart, Jeopardy, which he has hosted since 1984. While Jeopardy is by far his most famous show, he has hosted many others, including the short-lived Wizard of Odds, the 1976 version of Double Dare, not related to the Nickelodeon version, the $128,000 question, Pitfall, Battle Stars, a 1990 revival of To Tell the Truth, and another one of my faves, Classic Concentration. The host of the 1987 version was Wink Martindale, a native of Tennessee, and the host of many game shows, second only to the legendary Bill Cullen. A short list of Wink's many games include What's This Song, Gambit, Tic-Tac-Doe, Headline Chasers, The Great Getaway Game, Trivial Pursuit, and Debt. And just last year, Wink launched his own YouTube channel called Wink's Vault, featuring clips and episodes of game shows from the past, including pilots of shows that didn't sell. The show was conceived by Merrill Hader and Bob Quigley. Merrill and Bob created the long-running game show Hollywood Squares, which ran intermittently for a period of 38 years, with the most recent version ending in 2004. They also created the game shows Video Village, Shenanigans, and Gambit, and the cartoon Wacky Races, which launched the spin-offs, The Perils of Penelope Pitstop, and Dick Dastardly and Muttley and Their Flying Machines. Bob retired in 1981, and Merrill continued to produce game shows by himself, including Battle Stars, and as recently as 2008, Catch-21 on GSN, a spiritual successor to Gambit. Bob Quigley died in 1989. The announcer for the 70s versions was Kenny Williams. With a career beginning in radio in the 1940s, Kenny was a longtime partner with Heater Quigley Productions. He was the announcer and town crier in Video Village and played Kenny the Cop in Shenanigans. He was also the announcer on Gambit, hosted by Wink Martindale. But his most famous announcing job was that of the original Hollywood Squares, which he helmed for 15 years. The 80s version was announced by Dean Goss. Dean is a native of Santa Clara, California, and his voice has been heard on radio stations across the country for more than 40 years. He can be currently heard on country station KSONFM in San Diego. 
His game show announcing resume includes the all-new Let's Make a Deal, the short-lived NBC Kids game show I'm Telling, the infamous Bargain Hunters, and Double Dare ripoff Slime Time. By saying that, I am pretty much assured that Dean Goss will probably never want to have a beer with me. I've got to stop doing that. Anyway, let's get to gameplay. As I mentioned, the show was overhauled when NBC revived the show in 1978, and these rules were used for the 1987 version as well. I'll cover the gameplay for this version first. Two contestants competed. The object was to remove the numbers 1 through 9 from a game board by rolling an oversized pair of dice. In order to determine who gained control of the dice, Alex or Wink, would ask a toss-up question. The answers were usually multiple choice, true, false, or yes, no. Here's one example. According to statistics, the number of men having facelifts is almost the same as the number of women. Rick. No. You're right. The answer is no. It's nine to one in favor of women. Nine to one. The first contestant to buzz in received the chance to answer. Answering correctly got control of the dice. If that player answered wrong or not in time, the other player got control. Once in control, a player was given the choice to either roll the dice or pass and force the other player to roll. C contestants removed numbers 1 through 9 from the board based on the value of the roll of the dice, either by the number itself or in combinations that totaled the value rolled. For example, if a 10 was rolled, the contestant could remove any combination that added up to that number. 1 and 9, 2 and 8, 3 and 7, 4 and 6, 1, 2 and 7, and so on providing that none of the numbers within the combination had already been removed. The numbers were randomly arranged in three columns of three numbers apiece, with each column containing a prize, or on the 70s version, a prize package. Contestants only banked prizes when the last digit from each column was eliminated, regardless of who eliminated the other digits in that column, and could only keep the prizes by winning the game. Prizes were the usual game show fare, such as furniture, electronics, appliances, and trips though sometimes they gave away some weird, unusual stuff, especially on Alex's version, such as a collection of musical dolls, African masks, a fishbowl, and fully catered banquets. Hell, even a year's worth of KFC was given away. On Wink's version, sometimes one of the columns gave the player who wanted a right to play a mini-game, which I'll describe later. Also, at least one column was dubbed the Hot Column, meaning that all the numbers in the column can be removed with a single roll of the dice. Rolling doubles in the main game earned an insurance marker, which could be turned in for a second chance if a contestant made a bad roll. However, if the doubles roll itself was a bad roll, the contestant did not get a marker, but got to go again. So 2 and 12 were always good. What's a bad roll, you ask? Well, that's what happens when the value on the dice can't be taken off the board. Early in the game, players would usually keep rolling the dice, as the, odd, as the odds against making a bad roll were usually in their favor. But as the game progressed, it became more difficult to avoid a bad roll, which is why control of the dice was so important so you can force them on your opponent and hope they make a bad roll. Anytime a contestant does make a bad roll, they automatically lost and the round was over. Otherwise, play continued until all numbers were cleared from the board and the player to get rid of the last number won the game. Winning the game also won the contestant any prizes that they banked, or if they didn't bank any prizes, $100 in cash. In the 1978 version, the prizes were carried over to later rounds, and new prizes were added until there were a total of five in each column. In the 1987 version, however, new, more expensive prizes were added in each round. Prizes that weren't won in the previous rounds were now gone. The first player to win two games won the match and played the big numbers. The big numbers was the bonus round used in all versions of High Rollers, and the gameplay was the same. The goal was to remove the numbers 1 through 9 with a cash prize for clearing them all. Insurance markers were awarded for doubles, giving the contestant the opportunity to roll again if they made a bad roll. They'd pick up $100 for each number they removed, theirs to keep regardless of the outcome. If they could remove all nine numbers, they won $10,000 in cash. In the 1974 version, they won a new car for removing eight numbers, and then 10000 for all nine. In the 1978 version, they won $5,000 in cash and a new car, bringing the total to $10,000. If they made a bad roll without an insurance marker, the bonus game was over. A player also lost if they could remove all the numbers except for one. If they orphaned the one, they lost because that can't be rolled on a pair of dice, and this happened at least once. But regardless, that player was champion and got to play again until they were defeated or if they won five matches, seven in the 1978 version. Also in the 1987 version, retired champions originally won a new car, 
though this was later dropped, which led to more cars being awarded in some of the mini-games that were played. Now, what were the mini-games, you asked? Well, in Wink's version, the contestant who cleared the column containing a mini-game and then won the round had the right to play a special game where they used just one of the dice for a chance to win bonus prizes. A total of 11 mini-games were played during the nine-month run of Wink's version. Here's a few of them. Around the world, each number, one through five, corresponded to a trip, with a six winning all five trips. Regardless of the outcome, the player won $5,000 in spending money. Dice Derby, a horse racing themed game. One horse used the even numbers and the other the odd numbers. The contestant rolled the die and the horse moved one space depending on what they rolled. If the even number horse won, they usually won a new car. If the odd numbered horse won, then they won a smaller prize or $1,000 in cash. It takes two. Each number on the die corresponded to a different prize. The first number that they would roll twice was the prize the contestant won. If they rolled a six twice, then they won what Wink called the kitchen sink, which effectively gave them all the prizes. Love letters. The player rolled a die up to four times to reveal letters in a six-letter word. Once the player solved the word, they won a new car. Map game. Basically the same as around the world, with the only difference being that rolling a six didn't win all five trips, but rather they won a more expensive trip. Rabbit test. This game, which was played sparingly, involved the show's models wearing fur coats. This is before animal rights groups got their way. Thanks a lot, Bob Barker. One was a fake fur, one was a real fur worth $6,000. The contestant had to feel the coats and determine which one was real. The coat was theirs to keep regardless of the outcome. Wink's garage sale. The contestant rolled a die that won a prize that corresponded to that number. The six, however, was a gag prize, which they wanted to avoid. Smile and Wink's car lot. Each number on the die represented a car. The six, however, represented a clunker, even though it was operational. Now that does it for the format of high rollers most of us remember. But I mentioned that it was played differently when it first debuted in 1974. No video of this version exists, unfortunately, due to NBC's practices involving videotape at the time. So I'll be narrating over these screenshots I found online. Originally, each of the nine digits had a prize hidden behind it. When a player rolled that number, the prize was added to their bank. Two digits also had a half prize, similar to the half car now seen on Wheel of Fortune. The contestant had to bank both halves of the prize to win it, but if both contestants each revealed half the prize, it was taken out of play. And the contestants didn't roll the dice themselves. This was done by the show's hostess, Ruta Lee. The show's format was changed in the final seven weeks in 1976, in which a famous person was concealed behind the digits, and once a contestant guessed who it was, they won the game. A contestant could guess after they made a good roll. If a player made a bad roll, their opponent was allowed one guess for each remaining number on the board. With the Successfully guessing the correct person won the game and the prizes that were still concealed. The syndicated 1975 version was played the same way, with the only difference, besides the bigger budget, was that the same two contestants played for the whole half hour. They would play the main game and the winner would go on to play the big numbers. The losing player would then come back and play the next game, and they would keep doing this till time was called. And that's the story of High Rollers. And now we grade. Much like Scrabble, High Rollers is based on a board game, but unlike Scrabble, High Rollers did not deviate from its source material that much. Of course, High Rollers also required a player to be lucky. Control of the dice was also very important, especially later in the game, as the chances of making a bad roll increased, and as a result, contestants who buzzed in with the correct answer would then force the dice on their opponent and hope they rolled themselves a loss. The big numbers, on the other, other hand, was all about luck. You had to hope the dice were on your side, kind of like in Vegas, which is why it was always exciting to watch. With thousands of dollars in cash and prizes up for grabs, high rollers could leave you on the edge of your seat. Both versions were great, but I gotta give extra credit to the 1978 NBC version for gameplay due to the fact that prizes that weren't won were carried over to later rounds. As for the set, they both worked for their time periods, but I liked Wink's set better. When I was four or five years old and I first saw those colorful big numbers, I was hooked. Of course, High Rollers also benefited from having two of the best hosts in the business with Alex Trebek in the 70s and Wink Martindale in the 80s. Both hosts were excellent in their own right. However, there are rumors that in the 1980 finale, Alex was a bit tipsy. Watch these clips and see for yourself. A 9 or an 11 to stay alive. Hey, 4, 7, 9, 11. Staying alive with the Bee Gees. 
Seven, nah. Eight. Seven or an eight. Oh! Ah, oh, many moon come. That's a niner. In the four years and nine weeks that we've been on the air, a lot of things have happened. I've gained about eight pounds. <laughs> oh, no. Becky has gained about 17 pounds. Now, I put my weight on because I drank too much wine. Oh, you didn't. Becky gained her weight because she drank too much wine. Uh, While it's never been proven, and I don't think Alex himself even remembers, it certainly doesn't look like the professionalism that we've expected from his 32 years of hosting Jeopardy. But even Wink had a little bit of fun in the last taping of his version. He actually posted this video on YouTube of the rehearsal from that day in 1988. Watch for yourself. Racial prejudice, pollution, or rolling the dice off the table. What really pisses me off? <gasps> Wink just said a dirty word. There goes my childhood. Well, all kidding aside, High Rollers remains one of my favorite game shows. The bright, colorful set, especially in the 80s version, fabulous prizes, big money, great hosts. What else could you want in a game show? High Rollers gets an A-. Now let's talk about how I would revive the show if I had the chance. I wouldn't really change much. In fact, I would use an updated version of the 80s set with those colorful big numbers and in the process make a four-year-old boy a fan of game shows for life. I wouldn't change the gameplay at all, although I would make one alteration involving prizes. One prize would be put into each column to start the game, but the prizes that were not won would be carried over to subsequent rounds. This was done in Alex's version, but not Wink's. Contestants would also win $1,000 in cash for each game they won, even if they didn't win any prizes. The big numbers would be played the same way. A player would get $500 for each number they shut off, and they'd get $20,000 for removing all nine. I also would have this version hosted by Conan O'Brien's longtime sidekick, Andy Richter, and former Family Feud announcer Burton Richardson as the announcer for this show. Well, that's another game show review in the can. I'll be back next month with another way to waste 10 minutes or so of your time with another review of a classic game show. Until then, I'm the Geeky Libertarian. Happy Halloween, everybody.